warm welcome. My name is Henrik Palmgren and uh, I hope that you are comfortable wherever you are in the world and ready for another radio program. We have a uh, really good program for you today that will start off our 2010 season. We have comparative mythologist, author and teacher John Lash with us on the line. He's behind the website metahistory.org where uh, a lot of the world's myths, legend and uh, Gnostic teachings are uh, collected and discussed. I'm uh, sure that you've listened to our past programs uh, that we've done with John. Uh, if not, I recommend that you go into our archive and uh, tune in. Uh, as you might know, John is the author of Not in His Image, Gnostic Vision, Sacred Ecology and the Future of Belief. We have some r very interesting topics lined up for uh, today's program. We are going to talk about basically the uh, the mysteries, uh, Gnosticism and mystery schools uh, and also collect, uh, connect this with the um, globalist elite uh, from many camps around the alternative uh, research. We often hear that the elite are steeped as it were in uh, the mystery religions that they practice occult and sometimes even pagan rituals. The question of course is, uh, is this true? Can uh, this be specified further? And this is what we're going to begin to talk about with John here today. And then later on in our second hour, we are going to talk more about the, what the Gnostics did to protect their tradition and how they actually planted something in the minds of the uh, mind control freaks uh, that control our world today. And this is something that uh, John elaborates on, actually will sabotage, uh, sabotage their plans, basically. And this is actually related to the immediate future as well, if you will, then the 2000. 12 date. So uh, we have a full set of uh, topics here to discuss uh, further on today. So with that, I'd like to say uh, welcome back to Red Ice Radio, uh, John Lash, and thank you for coming on the program again. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you, as always. Uh, I think it would be really good if we can uh, set the stage a little bit, as it were, first here, John, and address the uh, presentations that you've done on the uh, mysteries, uh, Gnosticism as well. Uh, this is something that you wrote about, of course, in your book, Not in His Image. And uh, then, when, of course, we can go further into this and connecting it with your views on the uh, global elite, basically where things are heading, and some of the, I guess, then misconceptions about their involvement with the mysteries, uh, the these illuminated societies and their use of the occult and Gnosticism. Uh, so, if you will, John, tell us a little bit about, about the, the mysteries and what you mean with the mysteries uh, in regards to your writing and, and research, John. Well, the mysteries, of you, as you know, have been one of the primary subjects of my work. Uh, certainly, my book, Not in His Image, contains more information and elaboration about the nature of the mysteries, their origin, the practices that uh, were done in them, and so forth, than any other book, to my knowledge. Uh, don't want to be blowing my own horn here, but it is simply a fact, as far as I know, that you will not find any other book or any other source on the internet which gives you such an intimate and complete view of what the pagan mysteries were. The mysteries of the pagan world, the Mediterranean world, and the Near East and Egypt during the centuries uh, before uh, the Christian era. And I'd like to say, Henry, to start out, just before we go into the subject, uh, that I'd, I'd like to pose a question, well, why is this subject so important? Because after all, the mysteries that we're going to talk about a little bit here are very ancient. Uh, they were eliminated, uh, radically uh, destroyed. Their teachers were persecuted and murdered. Uh, a large part of the, almost all of the literature of the mysteries was destroyed, burned, and there were no mysteries practiced, no mystery religions, and no mystery cults operating in Europe after uh, the death of Hypatia in 415 AD. As you know, that incident of the murder of Hypatia is the opening chapter of my book. Yes. So I would like to say, well, what are we doing here? Why are we dragging ourselves back into this ancient uh, religious movement, this ancient spiritual movement, which is long dead? Why is it important? Uh, I think that at the end of this interview, I hope that at the end of this interview, it will be clear to your listeners that the, our knowledge of what the mysteries were is important because the mysteries are part of the solution. 
They were part of the solution for humanity when they existed, and they are part of the solution today. Uh, whereas all that we learn on the Internet and in many, many books about the Illuminati, the reptilian bloodlines, uh, the, 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 the use of mind control and occultism in a master program of totalitarian control, all that we hear about this is all about the problem. And we hear a lot about this. But the mysteries are about the solution. And I truly believe that if we go back and look at what the mysteries were in their true nature and what was done in the mysteries, it will provide us with the right orientation to face the situation in the world today uh, and this uh, apparent uh, takeover of society by uh, a totalitarian or globalist uh, elite. So that's why the subject uh, is so important. Absolutely. I hope that's clear. Absolutely. And maybe if, if you like, in, in brief here, John, you can also tell us a little bit about the uh, basically your background in terms well what, what I reckon got you started in all this so we can talk about the philosophies of Friedrich Nietzsche a little bit and how he influenced your life and, and your work as well is is he the primary uh, philosopher who got your eyes open uh, to, to these subjects to begin with John well Nietzsche I mentioned Nietzsche in the beginning in the preface to my book not in his image and uh, I describe in there how when I encountered Thus Big Zarathustra and I read a little bit of Nietzsche, I was only 17 at the time, I was living in a very small fishing village in Maine called Friendship, Maine, and I had nobody to, you know, talk to, but I was deeply impacted by this philosopher. I have to say that what impressed me about Nietzsche was that he dared to say that Christianity was a, a crapulent and dangerous faith. And since I was living in a tiny little community of 900 people that was dominated by a Christian cult, uh, I was uh, happy to hear that, uh, someone of his stature say that, because that's exactly has how I felt at the age of 17. And so the way that I have followed Nietzsche and attempted to, to uh, complete his work is in his critique of Christianity. Mm. Because he only he didn't really critique Christianity very well. He only pointed out a couple of things about it. And I vowed when I read Nietzsche that I would carry that critique to its final conclusion, which is what I do. And I want to point out that I have nothing against Christians as people. I've lived with Christians. I've known many of them all my life. I'm talking about the belief system and the ideology of Christianity. I'm talking about a belief system. I'm not talking about flesh and blood people. I do not hate Christians. But I do despise the belief system that has uh, established itself in the world as Christianity. Mm. And as you know, I, I have uh, analyzed that belief system at length. I call it salvationism. And uh, it's a salvationist uh, faith. And I truly believe that this salvationist faith is, is a toxic ideology. It's a pathological and psychotic outbreak of the human mind and it's very dangerous for our species so it was Nietzsche that initially put me on that path of uh, gave me the boost you could say mm. uh, to uh, make my critique of Christianity which you'll find in not in his image but as far as the mysteries are concerned uh, that's a different story uh, Nietzsche didn't write anything about the mysteries and uh, it was not through Nietzsche that I got turned in that direction but, but there's one thing in, in Nietzsche that, that kind of a little bit dovetails with this idea as well. I mean, he wrote about the concept of the Superman, for instance, and, right. and the Nazis have been, uh, you know, blamed for uh, for adopting uh, this this idea a little bit as well. And, and they were also, you know, in, from that from their point of view, then steeped in, in, in the occult and have occult roots and so forth. And that this this spawned this murderous, uh, you know, v volatile uh, political uh, philosophy, pretty much. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I do not adopt or endorse uh, Nietzsche's concept of the Superman in the sense of any kind of fascist or authoritarian super race theory or master race theory. Absolutely do not endorse it at all. I think it's despicable. And I have no interest in that. And I did not 
um, pick up that element in Nietzsche. I did not take Nietzsche's uh, writings about the Superman in that direction. Um, one of the there are a number of key claims that are made about the mysteries and Gnostics in connection with the mysteries that uh, really need to be corrected. And one of these is the claim of deification, deification, that is the turning of a human being into a god, or in the same sense, uh, achieving a superhuman state. Uh, something that you will often read uh, in writings of scholars who uh, expound about the mysteries and also in, 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 in talks of current people who are s saying that there was something bad in the mysteries, they will both give you the same piece of information. They will say that the goal of initiation in the ancient pagan mysteries was some kind of deification. That is to say, the turning of the human being into a divine being or the realizing realization of some divine empowerment well that is simply not the case the it is not the case in the sense that initiation in the mysteries would have fostered in people a sense of being superhuman or godlike and therefore superior to all other people uh, not at all the Experience of initiation in the mysteries allowed those who underwent it to, to discover their own hidden powers, especially the hidden power of noose or the divine intelligence. The point that I make, which no other scholar seems to have made, is that the elevation of human consciousness in the mysteries, the heightened awareness, was not uh, an inflation of the ego to a godlike state. It was the discovery of one's divine intelligence. And that germ of divine intelligence exists in everyone. The mysteries were egalitarian uh, movement. It's totally wrong to assume that they could have been the incubation tanks for uh, elitist power freaks. It's totally wrong. There is no historical basis for that. That is a completely unfounded claim. As a matter of fact, history tells us that the mysteries were open to all people. They were open to everyone of every age or every class. Slaves could participate in the mysteries as well as emperors, and they did. So the mysteries were egalitarian, and they did not have at their heart any kind of agenda that can be remotely compared to an Illuminati, fascist, totalitarian con control scheme. That is entirely false, and I would challenge anyone who has made that claim, uh, for instance, David Icke, to come forth with the evidence that that was the case. When you go into the evidence that exists historically about the mysteries, you will find that they were not at all of that character. So that's one of the things that's concerned me lately, uh, and we talked about this before the interview, is that... Um, you find this claim coming up more and more uh, as people are exposing the agenda of the globalist elite, which I'm totally in favor of. The same time that they're doing that, they're saying, oh, and by the way, don't you know that the ancient mystery religions were the source of occult practices, and it was in these movements that the, uh, the forerunners of this globalist elite uh, learned uh, their sinister game. Absolutely and totally wrong. And that's a very serious error to make because as I said at the beginning of this talk, the mysteries are part of the solution. They are not part of the problem. And so if we contaminate them by association with the solution, I think we're going to be uh, making a very serious error there. Okay, well, th there's a few points here then that we can uh, talk about right away. If, if you sure. look at the... Uh, uh, you know, basically about the expansion of the Roman Empire. Uh, again, a lot of researchers are are, are drawing uh, the the connection between the Roman Empire and Christianity. When uh, when when uh, you know uh, we have the Christianization uh, Christianization with the Constantine and so forth of the Roman That's Empire, right. um, and then to a lot of researchers, the Roman Empire Empire has a history in in, in pagan religion. 
uh, what can you what can you say about that? Many people would then say, "Ah, oh, look at that! That's evidence that the roots of the whole uh, project here that began are actually pagan in their origin." Yeah, well, Christianity in the, through Constantine, and I have a comment about him coming up here in a minute. Christianity through Constantine, who effectuated the marriage of Christianity with the Roman state, has nothing to do with the with the indigenous paganism of the Roman people the inhabitants of the empire. The inhabitants of the Roman Empire were many different nationalities, Italian, Spanish, or Iberian, Greek, even the, the Britonic peoples of the British Isles, as you know, came under the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was a vast organization, but the populace of the Roman Empire were pagans. And when Constantine, Constantine, you know, was the first Christian emperor, right? Constantine was about as much of a Christian as George Bush. You know, yeah, that's the kind of Christian he was. Even his historian, his official historian, Eusebius, said of Constantine that he wasn't sure that his conversion was an act, a political act, or whether it was genuine. Right. But in any case, it had to be portrayed as genuine because you have to write a good story about the people who are in power. I mean, even the historian who gave us that story of Constantine's conversion is admitting bald-facedly how phony it was. The purpose of that story was so that there would be a nice, pretty conversion story to convince people that uh, there was something authentic at the basis of the marriage of the Roman military empire and Christianity. Mm. The Roman military empire merged with Christianity to become the Holy Roman Empire. But the paganism, the indigenous paganism, of the Roman, of the people who lived under the Roman Empire, did not merge with Christianity at all. So you have to make that distinction. And do you think it's therefore today that we have uh, a, a lot of the the, uh, the 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 pagan blend, if you if you know what I mean, with Christianity? In that sense, we can look at the the winter solstice celebration. It's very kind Christmas. to call it a blend, Henrik. It's just a pure ripoff. <laughs> you know, uh, one remark that I found quite alarming occurs in the beginning of this film called Esoteric Agenda, which is an expose in some respects of the Codex, Codex Alimentarius. And uh, one of the remarks, I think this film is done by someone called Ben Sherman. Uh, Stewart, Ben Stewart. We have ben had, Stewart, had him on the program, me. actually, yes. One of the things that Ben Stewart says is that Christianity is permeated with pagan symbolism and ritual. And he infers from that that paganism survives in a manner in Christianity. He says paganism in its evolution, that's his exact term, meaning as it developed or morphed, paganism morphed or survived in Christianity. Nothing could be less true at all. Let me give you an analogy. Suppose a group of people came into your house of your family, of you and your brothers and sisters and your mother and father, and they took Everything that's in your house, all of your personal belongings, your records, your diaries, your clothes, and they moved them to another house and wore all your clothes and kept all your diaries and photographs around and actually took over your life and stole your identity. But they could not actually live your life, could they? No. It would be a stolen identity. So likewise, Christian, uh, paganism, the true life of paganism, could never be stolen. And so the true life and spirit of paganism did not survive in Christianity, did not survive at all, except in very uh, remote country areas of Europe, very, very er areas where people still clung to their pre-Christian rituals and beliefs. What happened was that Christianity simply ripped off the rituals and the symbols of paganism and used them for their own purposes because it was easy it was that was an easy way to get the pagan people to believe that Christianity was similar to what they already embraced right you right know? it's a, that that's the smooth transition because otherwise if if it would have been too too far and the people would never have uh, accepted it they wouldn't let it and into they would have, and they would have rejected it and they did reject it mm -hmm. you know the the uh the, a, a great part of the pagan world for centuries, let's say that the rise of Christianity began actually with the Zadokite cult, 
in Palestine around 150 BC, before the his, supposed historical Jesus. And so there's a period of about 150 BC up until about 450 AD. That's like uh, more than 500 years when Christianity had to, uh, you know, gradually took over. There was an enormous resistance in the pagan world at that time. Uh, a number of the pagan intellectuals who were the teachers and highly respected figures of that time uh, totally rejected Christianity as a, as a pestilence. They called it a virus and a plague. They said it was a despicable faith. Uh, why? Mainly for one reason, which I've pointed out in my book. Christianity glorifies the redemptive value of suffering. Mm. And that is totally contrary to pagan beliefs. Pagan, a pagan, will define later on maybe at more, at more length what I'm calling a pagan. But a pagan is a person who does not believe that human suffering has a divine purpose. That is a very pervert, perverted idea from a pagan point of view. Mm. So there was a great resistance to this uh, belief system of Christianity and to the supernaturalism of the Messiah. There's no Messiah in any pagan religions. There's no equivalent to the Messiah. And I have to say that, uh, unfortunately, some comparative mythologists, apart from myself, who are highly respected in this world, have led people to believe that, oh yeah, uh, the Christian Messiah, Jesus Christ the Messiah, is, is similar to other figures in pagan religion or pagan culture, such as Balder in Norse myth or Angus in Celtic myth. This is, this is a false parallel. Uh, the supernatural Messiah whose suffering has supreme magical value of saving the world is a unique to the belief system of Christianity. And pagan people would not have that belief. They would not have accepted that belief if it wasn't put over on them in a very clever way. Mm. And one of the clever ways was to say, well, we're going to adopt, don't, don't resist us, because we're going to adopt your symbols and rituals. And you'll see, we'll just use them in our way, but it'll really be the same game. And it wasn't the same game at all. And at the very same time that the uh, early Christians in Europe uh, adopted and co-opted pagan symbols and rituals, they were ferociously busy eliminating uh, the pagan tradition of books and learning and destroying the mystery centers and persecuting the leaders of those centers. So they played that double game. Well, that's a good point. I w wanted to ask you about that then, if you, if you believe it's true that the, the Roman Empire uh, and through them and through the military empire that you mentioned, basically they started the execution of the, of the Gnostic people. They, they, uh, they killed people who had the knowledge from the ancient world and in one sense sense they might have extracted it for themselves or or it might have been lost as it claimed in many many uh, texts and so forth that the 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 literature and so forth was burned and all was 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 lost i still think that some of amount of that knowledge was uh, taken into the the top echelons within the roman empire but that's difficult to say but basically would you say that they started the execution of the, the of the learned elders as it were well they certainly did and there's very there, there is historical evidence of that and uh, the might of the Roman Empire, once the empire was turned, but was united with uh, the new uh, religion, uh, some of it was directed toward the persecution of uh, paganism. You know, paganism and pagan rituals and uh, and beliefs were uh, ruled uh, uh, forbidden on penalty of death already around 385 A.D. And um, why would you need to do that? You know, yeah. but ask this question. Anybody out there who believes that Christianity was originally, or in any sense still is, a religion of love, then wouldn't you say that coexistence is essential to love? Yeah, of course. That coexistence would be one of the first proofs of love. That if you carry love in your heart and you carry love in your relation to other human beings, that you would show them an attitude of coexistence. Isn't that reasonable? Well, when you look at the historical record, there is absolutely no record of early Christian ideologues or converts wanting to coexist with pagans or with 
the leaders and representatives of the mystery schools. They did everything they could to eliminate them. And you know, in many cases, Henrik, they didn't need the force of uh, the military force of the Roman Emperor to do that. The, uh, the, the monks who were early monks who were created to, uh, who were converted to Christianity were like stormtroopers. Hmm. And one, uh, one historian describing the takeover of uh, Egypt by Christianity actually uses that term. says that the Christian monks were so fanatical, they were like stormtroopers. They went into the ancient sanctuaries of mystery knowledge in Egypt, the temples of Luxor, the temples of, uh, of Pindera, uh, and, which is close to Nag Hammadi, and the temples of Memphis and around Cairo, and they fanatically destroyed and burned all these books. It didn't need the military to do it. The religious converts did it themselves. And the history of the rise of Christianity is, is, the, is the history of a cultural genocide of an enormous magnitude. And one of the reasons why we have lost our way in this world and why we have become a species that can be manipulated and controlled by a small psychotic group of our own members is because the mysteries and the wisdom in the mysteries was destroyed and we lost the foundation of our species vision. I just, this, as you know, you've read my book. This is what I, this is the story that I tell in my book. Uh, and in one way, the, the, the warring monks that you, that you mentioned, we can tie these in together with the Knights Templar then, and the Knights of Malta and these various group who were performing the, uh, d- during the Crusades as well, but there are earlier versions of, of this as well. Absolutely. You know, uh, I, this business of the, of the long-term history of, the, of these secret orders and the Masons and the Illuminati and everything is, is very, very complicated. And I'm afraid sometimes that we might get a little lost and, and too absorbed in that. Again, that's all part of the problem, you know? I think we know enough about the problem now since... Uh, we can never know enough about the problem, excuse me, but I think we know as much about the problem as we need to know to start putting the solution together really fast. And uh, one of the things that I would say is that whenever you have military orders and secret orders, uh, you're not talking about the mysteries or anything derived from them. The mysteries were not like that. They had no military factor whatsoever and that's one of the reasons why they could be could have been wiped out yes yes and exactly. why they couldn't protect themselves uh we had uh, a, a gentleman called gary Biltcliffe a while back on the program and he for instance told about the etruscans the pre-roman civilization and mm-hmm. basically how uh, their knowledge of uh, the building of the aqueducts and and certain things uh were basically ripped uh you know by the uh, by the roman empire and they gained a lot of their knowledge from this, uh, allegedly, they're very, very friendly uh, people, and they had a lot of uh, valuable information that the Roman Empire uh, used in order to to ex- expand in the in the in the manner that they did. You know? Oh, totally. The Etruscans were an indigenous people of Italy uh, who gave, who generously and freely gave uh, to the foundations of Roman culture, uh, and then they were, of course, uh, you know eliminated when they had been, when they had given what they had to give and they didn't fit into the uh particular power structure that the uh that the Romans were creating in that in that time and setting you know it's just tremendously important that we need to understand that um the great orchestration of uh evil if you want to call it social evil i don't believe in cosmic evil as you know henrik in in absolute or cosmic evil mm. or some satanic or demonic force in the universe. But I do believe in social evil. And so what is social evil? It's just an expression of a human psychosis. It's an expression of a breakdown of, of the human mind and of a pathology that can uh, run rampant and is doing so now. But when we were trying to trace, we're, we're, we're humans and we're fascinated by what, what happened to us and how we could be in this terribly frightening world that we live in today. And so we're going back and trying to understand this orchestration and we're digging up all this information about these secret societies and these Knights Templars. In the process of doing all that, fine, let's not forget that there was a, an inviolable teaching and an inviolable core of human wisdom that has nothing to do with that. 
And that was preserved in the mysteries. And that's why the mysteries, even though they were destroyed, live inside us today. I don't believe we can recreate the mysteries as such in the form that they were, say, 400 or 500 BC, or even during the time of, of uh, you know, several couple of centuries after the Christian era. It's not about recreating them; it's about dis- rediscovering what the mysteries were in our own human potential, and that's where the solution lies. Mm. I really believe that that is where the solution lies, and I believe it's time to start talking as much about the solution as about the problem. And uh, that's something that we want to do here. I want to ask you a few things uh, more before that. For instance, the the schism then, or the 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 psychotic, if you will, or or a schizophrenic rather, a relationship to uh, the message of Christ. Again, it's very difficult because you can pick certain things and interpret that in a certain way and so forth. But the the overall and basic idea of of of, of Christ and you know, love your neighbor, be kind, show love, uh, uh, things like that. How can that message, so so to speak? be taken over then by this by this other cult, the Roman Empire and later on Christianity, which uh, expanded itself with violence and, and everything that goes against this message. How do you kind of explain that, if you will, John? You know, we've reached a point, Eric, I think, where we've, we have so much delved into this problem that we're at risk of, of getting buried in what we've learned, uh, even if it's valid. So... I'd like to propose a new way, a new kind of idiom or a new paradigm for looking at the problem of the uh, globalist uh, control game. I'd like to say it's not about us or them. It's about a psychotic break in the human species. And the people who are instruments of that psychotic break are the ones who are doing harm to the rest of the species. Mm. Okay, so it's about a psychosis, and any of us can be subject to this psychosis. And and if we want to say, first recognize this psychosis, I think we're doing, made some immense steps toward recognizing how the psychosis operates. You've got to realize one thing, that these people, this small globalist elite who practice all these elaborate mind control uh, games on us, are mind controlled by their own games. You know, they're not Illuminati sitting back in some state of enlightenment and pulling the strings. They are pulled by their own strings. Right, right. They're as sick as the game that they perpetrate. And any of us can contract that sickness. What we have to understand is we have to respect the sickness and how clever it is. The sickness is very clever. And it can use love or peace or anything you like to achieve its aims. You know, uh... Back uh, in, the, in the last years or so before I left the States, I was reading about serial killers a lot and researching serial killers. And I read a couple of books about Ted Bundy. Mm-hmm. He's probably the most famous serial killer in the States. He killed like 16 or 20 people. And Ted Bundy is what you call, you know, a sociopath. It's an important term. These people in the globalist elite are not privileged or enlightened people who are operating from some occult power of of omnipotence. They're just very clever sociopaths. And Ted Bundy was one of the most likable guys in the world. Mm. Did you know that? Mm. He was charming. And when a certain place, I think it was in Florida, became very alarmed because a couple of college girls had been murdered by Ted Bundy. No, I think it was in Washington State. The uh, the town where it happened set up a uh, a team, uh, a volunteer team, and Ted Bundy volunteered on that team to find himself. Hmm. And he was one of the most affable and trusted members of the team that was looking for him. Hmm. Now, you have to register that story just for a moment in your mind. That's the kind of people we're talking about. And they're the kind of people that can use the message of love to murder you with. <laughs> and, and anybody can do that, any human being can do that if they become demented enough. We're talking about a dementia, a planetary dementia. The globalist movement is not so much an orchestration of secret and powerful and privileged people. It's more or less a dementia breaking out in our species. And so we, of the species who do not want to succumb to that dementia, 
in that psychosis have to find, first of all, have to analyze it, recognize what it is, yes. respect it for its power, but find in ourselves the, uh, the immunity to resist it and the power to defeat it. And we are at that moment. We're in a countdown. We're in a countdown with this psychosis. Uh, what is stronger, you know, the power of love and enlightenment and uh, the power of the willingness to coexist or this control syndrome? What is stronger? You know, we are in the end time in that sense in that we are in the end game of that process. Mm. Um, and it's extremely important to understand, do not give these people, do not invest them with some mystical aura. You know, they are monstrous, sick people like a serial killer uh, sociopath. They're like that. That's the kind of people we're talking about. And they're just human beings like you and I who happen to have succumbed to this particular uh, psychosis. Now, it's true that there are methods and schools and lineages for preserving this psychosis. I mean, that's pretty weird. <laughs> but they don't originate from the mystery schools. I can guarantee you that. But would you would you say that the this elite that you're talking about are indeed then using certain? Well, uh, depends on how we define occult techniques. But let's leave it with that for now. Occult techniques to to pro progress the sickness or, or or their agenda. Meaning, I guess then that the occult techniques they're using are are hidden, as as the word means. They're hidden to us because we are unaware of them, and therefore it's it's easy for us to recognize. Up, oh, they're using occult uh, slash esoteric knowledge to, to propel the, their agenda, John? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm glad you bring up this question because I think we have to be extremely careful about this uh, talk. And I would feel more at ease if we could somehow revise our language here. Uh, you know, I, I hear these elaborate uh, discussions, these elaborate expositions by people like Alan Watt, you know, explaining at length for hours on end how these uh, people use uh, symbols, uh, ancient occult symbols, and they put them into the logo of these corporations, and they're controlling our minds. I think that's way, way over the top. I think that's giving them far too much power. Um, I think that we have to deflate the notion of what is the occult, and at the same time, respect the genuine value of the occult. You know, the word occult means nothing but hidden or latent. So basically, occultism is not a spooky thing. Occultism, which I have practiced all my life, I'm an occultist. What does that mean? doesn't mean I'm a Satanist. doesn't mean I use uh, spooky mind control techniques on people around me. It means that I investigate and explore in the rationality and sanity of my mind the hidden potential of human beings. Occultism is about the hidden potential of human beings. And you can say that these uh, globalist manipulators do use occultism in a certain sense, in that they know certain things about the power of suggestion and telepathy, and they know how to manipulate people largely through the subconscious. Mm. But any person who wants to make a study, who wants to dedicate two or three years of their life to studying the subconscious and all the things we know about it now can learn everything that the Illuminati are using and 10, ten times more mm, yeah. and use it for anything they like. And so to credit them with some kind of uh, preponderant influence over us because of their occult techniques, I believe is entirely wrong. And I'm, uh, uh, I'm disturbed when I hear that kind of language coming from people who are genuinely trying to, uh, you know, to expose these perpetrators. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have to be careful in exposing them that we don't make them look more powerful than they are. Well, that's a very good uh, po point, John, in that sense. And, and do you think that that could be part of the, uh, of the game as well, part of the uh, psychosis then, that give, give the people uh, that the idea... Uh, the the idea of perception here that they are indeed this powerful. They have access to to certain knowledge that uh, that you do, don't have, and hence, therefore, they will be uh, dangerous. And you need to respect them out of fear for for that purpose. 
Absolutely, Henrik. There's a huge Wizard of Oz factor in the global Illuminati scam. You know? Mm -hmm. And not only that, but I have to tell you that uh, the thing that I think about day in and day out regarding this subject uh, maybe we'll strike a note with other people as well. I don't know. I mean, we've, uh, I, I suspect that people who are listening to me right now have, have watched, you know, these YouTube documentaries, uh, these internet documentaries. They've listened to many clips on YouTube. They've read the, the articles. We've all been forming a massive picture of the operations and orchestrations that are, uh, apparently running, uh, the human social order in a very destructive way. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're, we're all sort of on to that game, but I would ask you, have you ever wondered, well, what's the counter game? Well, that is the big, uh, that is the big question. And it seems to me at this point that what's building up, what I can see from my point of view is that the, I, I, at the, because at the same time, I recognize the, the urgency of getting the information out and, and it can be argued if it's delivered in the right way, is it right to, to, Give out this, give it out through fear. In one way, uh, we have the method of of you know scaring people so they awake. In one way, if you know what I mean, you have to. That's right. You know, that's right. Really shake people up. You know, in that sense, and so the, fear can have a positive value if it's delivered in the right dose and in a balanced way with this information. Yes. You know. Yes. It is a frightening thing to think that that uh, we could be living uh, in a society that is run by its worst specimens. I mean, that is a frightening idea. Yeah. yeah. But it's a really wake-up idea because if that's the case, or if it's anything like that, then we really have to pay attention and take action. You see. Yeah. But any expose of the great orchestration uh, of social evil—I'm going to call it the or great orchestration of social evil and the great deception that we see. For instance, in 9/11, in the global uh, global warming scam, any expose of that needs to be balanced by the counter magic. If there can be, I ask you, if there can be such a huge, century-long orchestration toward social evil, why can't there be a huge, century-long orchestration toward the overcoming of social evil? Oh. Where is the counter myth? Mm. Yeah. Where is the counter magic? Yeah. That's the question I ask myself. Where is the counter magic? If they are using a sort of black magic on us, and I believe they are, I mean, advertising is black magic, man. Yeah. I have to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me sick. I, I, get, I can't look at an advertising poster in the street without getting a bit nauseous. <laughs> it really makes me sick to see advertising because it's completely phony and completely uh, blatant programming of people. But if they are using that black magic in politics and advertising in the media and entertainment, where is the counter magic? Tell us about let's let's go into that then, John, and and tell us a little bit about the the, the counter magic and also about this idea that you mentioned before, uh, the the immune. How do we develop and uh, uh, d develop the immunity to resist the the spreading of this dementia? You know. Uh, it's been difficult for me to present what I know because I really don't have any ego invested in it. I don't want to be a cult leader. I don't want to be necessarily famous or recognized or anything. But I do believe that my recovery of the Sophia myths of the ancient mysteries and my disclosure of the practices in those mysteries is a unique piece of information. And I'm sorry that I have to say that myself, but I do have to point that out. As far as I know, it's unique. No one else is talking about this in this particular way. You know that uh, there's been a tremendous amount of things written about the Nag Hammadi uh, writings in Coptic that were found in December 1945 in Egypt. I was born in December 1945 and may have been born in the very week that those documents were discovered. Mm. And I have spent a great deal of my time recovering the mystery knowledge in those documents. Well, you can read many books by other scholars about Nakamadi and find anything like what John Lash is saying. 
that bothers me a little because I don't want to appear to ask people to see me as special. But at the same time, I do believe that what I have been developing is very special, very special indeed. Why so? I'll give you two reasons, and this is by way of answering your question about immunity and beyond immunity, about overcoming this black magic Mm. on the planet. The practice of the ancient mysteries, of the ancient pagan mysteries, was based on a story the myth of the goddess Sophia, or the Aeon Sophia, to use an Gnostic term. I'm a comparative mythologist. I've looked at myths from all over the world. I've analyzed every creation myth that you can think of, from the Aboriginal creation myths, to the ancient Greek mythology, Japanese, the Hopi, the Inuit, you name it. I tell you, on my best professional opinion, there is no myth of planetary evolution that explains the origin of the human species, explains our relation to the earth, the nature of the earth, the divinity of the earth, the divine powers invested in us, the risk of archontic or deviant powers, that is to say the risk of a psychosis or schizophrenia within our own species. All of these elements are uniquely described in one story the story of the goddess Sophia, and not in any other myth. I've elaborated that story in my book and on the website. People can go and read it. It's a story. It's a myth. Why is it so important? First of all, because it's a myth of what that actually describes planetary evolution. It's not a myth in the sense of a fiction or invention. It's a myth that is a poetic and mythological rendition of certain events. And the mysteries were guided by this myth. People taught this myth and shared this myth. And it was the foundation of their whole vision of life. And I believe that this myth is the planetary myth that our species needs in order to pull itself together and to understand its own and realize its own empowerment. The second thing about the mysteries that I have disclosed in my book is what the method of the mysteries was. You know, if you read their ancient accounts about the mysteries, one of the things that they say, ancient scholars say this, and and also certain modern scholars, such as G.R.S. Mead, who was a theosophist at the beginning of the 20th century, the initiates of the mysteries were the great teachers and educators of humankind. Now just think about that for a moment. And I would like to ask you, if, if anyone thinks that the current representatives of the globalist slash Illuminati control freak cult uh, derived out of the mysteries, then I would ask you, would you consider these people to be great educators and teachers of mankind? Um, well, in one sense, I would say yes. Actually, dep- so? depending on how you view it, of course, but I also recognize in the process of the these uh, orders and the global elite that are in charge right now, they, okay, I recognize the problem that they potentially are behind the uh, dumbing down, if you will, of humanity, but also their presence and their actions uh, today spawns people to, or, or urges people to to rise up. You know, the, it, it draws something out of us without them the question is if we would have been uh, in the awakening process. A lot of us are in the in that process. A lot of people still have to go through it. If you go out and ask people on the street, the majority don't even know about all of this stuff that we're discussing today, John. But but if we're talking about this, uh, the few people who are at least begin, be, beginning in the process of awakening to this reality, then I can see that they are also p- playing a role in all of this, if you follow my line of thinking there. Well, they play an adversarial role. I yes. would agree with that. Yes. The challenge that they that they present to us uh, forces us to educate ourselves and to wake up. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But they cannot in any way be compared to the initiates of the mysteries who were truly educators. They taught people to read and write. They taught the sciences and the arts. They founded the great universities and libraries of the ancient world. So what happened in the mysteries? The mysteries were largely more like a collegiate or educational system. 
This is how they operated. Mm. And this is not just my opinion. I've documented this. Yeah. But what was at the core of the mysteries that made them really special was that there was the experience of their method of teaching. And that I've called that instruction by the light. So the ultimate secret of the mysteries that they were people who uh, were initiated were not allowed to discuss publicly was this experience of the light or the organic light, as I call it. And that experience was the inviolable core of the mysteries. And uh, that was how the mystery initiates themselves acquired their higher knowledge. It was through the encountering the organic light that they were able to realize their own godlike potential, that is the divine intelligence in us, in everywhere in nature. It's in the snails, it's in the clouds, but it's in us in a particular way. Mm. And they realized the divine intelligence in us without becoming inflated into thinking that they were gods on earth or that they could control the world through some kind of godlike posturing, you see? And it's difficult to convey, perhaps, the sanctity of that experience. If you want to think that there's one thing in human experience that could never be perverted or violated, then that is it. And if you go to Meta History and you read, uh, go to Lydia's Well and read the little piece called Lydia's Vow, you see how Lydia, as my colleague, explains that the vow to, to not describe this light as I'm describing it to you now, and I can describe it in more detail, the vow to not describe it was a way to protect that experience. But those initiates knew that at a certain time in the future, it would be necessary to come out and say openly and publicly what the organic light is and how the, that experience is accessible to every person on earth, that is the most intimate form, the most intimate access we can have to the divinity of the earth itself. Because that light is actually the emanation of the goddess Sophia. It is her pure emanation as a divine being. And it is something very specific and particular. It's not like anything else. It's a unique phenomenon to be encountered in a heightened state. So the mysteries were essentially provided, they essentially provided to anyone who wanted the opportunity to be taken to that light and shown that light. Now, a lot of people couldn't see it, or a lot of people could see it, they couldn't retain it. But among the many thousands and thousands of people, because it was an egalitarian uh, process, who were taken by the initiates and shown the light some of them saw it and were able then to go and see it again themselves. And it was through their direct relationship to that light that they became initiates and they carried on the great teaching and visionary practices of those mysteries. Mm. Now, as far as I know, I'm the first person to, abs to actually disclose this openly, what happened, talking to you as if I was someone who was there and talking to you as if you could be there. That's the way it has to be told, as if you could be there, because you can be there. This experience of the organic light is not obligatory to anyone. You may hear about it and think, what's that? You know, I'm not interested. You may be interested and want to study about it. Then read Metahistory Org and Google the organic light or read my book you may find that you're really attracted and you say, I want to have this experience. That is the beginning of the, the retrieval of mystery knowledge is to have that experience directly. That is to go back to the core from which those initiates themselves were enlightened. And this is the time when this must be made known because in the experience, Experience and power and wisdom of that light comes the magic so, for our own for our own process. So this is uh, what you're talking about here is more 
uh, of of an experience than than literal knowledge in in that sense. I mean, you might uh, attain this then by reading cer- reading certain things and 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 getting the knowledge about it. But ultimately, what you're describing is is about an experience, not about a a, a book. It in is that an sense. experience. Yeah, it is an experience. And you know, one of the things that we've learned, Henrik, about shamanic experiences is that they are consistent when they are done in the right setting and discipline. Uh, It's widely thought, unfortunately, because of a recreational use of psychoactive plants and because of a lot of ignorance around shamanism, even today, it's widely thought that someone takes a psychoactive plant like a psilocybin mushroom or iboga or ayahuasca, and then they go off into a series of sort of chaotic hallucinations or whatever. As a matter of fact, you probably know in the aboga cult and in the ayahuasca cult, when the neophytes come in and three or four of them take the sacred medicine, they have their visions, the veterans or elders, consisting of men and women, sitting around them, don't necessarily take the sacred plant at that session. They know exactly what the neophytes are experiencing who've taken it. Mm. In other words, you have to recognize, and this is a big step for many people, but try to recognize, I'm not saying you have to, because you don't have to do anything as far as I'm concerned, but try if you will, consider if you will, that there are certain mystical experiences in heightened states which are totally voracious, voracious and consistent. And this is one of them. Those who experience the organic light know exactly what they're seeing, and everyone sees the same thing. And then out of that experience comes an absolute wellspring of teaching and wisdom, healing, vision, play, uh, erotic awakening, immunity. Uh, It is the body, the, the organic light is the living body of the goddess who is the embodied spirit of this planet. And so would you say then that the uh, the uh, adversary to this um, has is now then the this uh, dementia this uh, psychosis that you, that you were talking about that there is a if you will then a kind of a battle going on here between the, these forces or, or is this totally external this is not about a battle at all there's no there's, it's not about a battle and I'm glad you brought that up I really don't think it is you know uh, in my book not in his image there's one uh, section where I cl- quote uh, some Neoplatonic philosopher, I think it's Plotinus, who says that, you know, there's no contest. The sacred allows no contest. There's no contest with the sacred. There's nothing that can compete with or overwhelm the sacred. The situation with humanity is that by having lost touch with nature itself, uh, and then, at a deeper sense, having failed to uh, recognize and perpetuate this meeting with the light, that we have strayed away from our own intelligence. You know, we have strayed away. We have become demented. But the dementia is a mental and spiritual illness that can be healed by uh, contact with the light and by other means. But it's not about a battle. They, they, uh, the forces that are mind-controlling and mind-fucking the human species have absolutely no power over the organic light, and they have no equivalent to it. Mm. None whatsoever. I assure you, there is no absolute battle of light and darkness. That is a very uh, misleading and erroneous myth. Um, But that is a myth that is embraced by the perpetrators because it serves them very well. Mm. Uh, That's why they want to lead the world toward uh, an apocalypse or a holocaust. That's in their script. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it, John, do you think that this is, uh, we can begin here to round things up with the first hour on, sure. on some of these notes here, but do you think that this then is the, uh, in one way, if the sickness has come into humanity and, the, and primarily then the, the psyche of, of humanity, um, is this done by, this might be a weird question, though, but is this done by a higher force in order to, if you will, then uh root out some of these these the, the people who are sick in much in the same way if we look at a human body or something like that if we get a, a bruise or, or something happens with our body the, the body instant, 
right away starts to working at ex getting rid of of the the dead flesh or 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 something like that that we're looking at a pr kind of a pruning process here in a weird kind of way and this is just a very unfortunate uh, uh, way that, that we see this playing out in the world today or, or can we make any kind of other analogies here to what we're what we're facing well that's really an important question you know Henrik. I think that we're far enough along in our investigation of the great orchestration of social evil we call it the new world order the Illuminati call it what you like I think we're far enough along in that investigation that we might benefit from refining some of our language especially in regard to to this that you're asking me right now. You know, I'll give you my best shot. The Gnostics, who didn't call themselves Gnostics, by the way, that was an insult that was applied to them by uh, Christian ideologues and their enemies. Uh, it meant smart-ass or know-it-all. <laughs> the Gnostics never called themselves Gnostic, Gnosticai. They called themselves Telestai, which means we who are, aim we who are aimed. Yes we who are aimed. And by that they meant that they were aimed or focused by the story of the Divine Sophia. That was their aim. The story guided them in everything they did. Now, the Gnostics warned about what they called plane, plane being the main technique of the archons or mind parasites. It doesn't matter what you, where you think these mind parasites come from. All that matters is that you would understand the nature of mental parasitism in mental and dementia. And plenty means to stray. So the problem is not that there is some great divine plan of retribution here and humanity is being called. We're in this condition of dementia because we've strayed. We've strayed from the place in the evolutionary niche of nature where we can thrive. And when we stray, we become more and more demented. The pagans, pagan simply means a person of the country, paganus. It's a Latin word. It means country person, peasant, country dweller. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pagans were not Satanists. They did not sacrifice babies or practice human sacrifice. Pagans did not practice human sacrifice. This is a very serious piece of disinformation. I'm not saying that instances of human sacrifice didn't occur in the ancient world. They've always occurred. The pagans were the people who didn't, had not strayed. They did not stray. They remained in their ecological and bioregional niche, and they practiced their life in a ritual sanctity and a bond with nature. As soon as we stray with, from that bond and that ritual observation of our life in nature, we become demented, and we are now reaching the extreme limit of that dimension. But there's no grand plan about it, not that I see. You know, mm. I think that's part of the psychotic mentality of the of the perpetrators. They wanted to make us think that there's some kind of a plan, and we're not in on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's about. Well, don't go for it. Exactly, it's about it. putting setting yourself outside of that and and uh, becoming more of an observer of it, and, and obviously again then instigate uh, the the, cha the change that we personally, individually as well, want to see uh, in the world, and don't get involved in that in that battle, you know, because uh, this will feed more into it, right? We need to inform ourselves of any kind of treachery or deception that is happening in the social order. Obviously, that's a responsibility of any social person yep. in whatever society you live in, Sweden, Spanish, you know, Indonesian. But the change can only come one person at a time. And it only comes from the inside of each person who reconnects and realigns to the earth. Because the earth is our mother source and it is the source of our intelligence and of the all of the healing and vision that we need is in our connection to the earth and that is precisely what the uh the globalist perpetrators don't have they don't have that and what you've been talking about here john is basically the the story then that outline uh this process and, and how in one way we can read about the myths uh, you know in in terms of this story and hence get a better idea of what the what the experience is that you mentioned that that you that you talked about before and sure you know i wanted to say in in closing this session that the myth that i you know obviously strongly hyping the myth of the divine sophia a it's not john lash's creation okay but please be uh reassured folks i didn't invent this myth i just restored it from the existing fragments but even more important 
consider that this myth is not a totalitarian story that's imposed on you. It's a vision story that inspires and nurtures your own divine understanding. Like no other story you will ever find. So, John, uh, tell us then about, a little bit more about your book here, about your your website, uh, and basically, if you have any, uh, let's say, one on one kind of you know basics uh, for people who want to read more about this, where they can go specifically on your website in order to to read up on some of this, and if they want to dig further into it. Thanks for asking, Henrik. I just finished just finishing now the revamping of the so-called psych guide of my website. So, if you go to www.metahistory. Dot org, you get the home page. In the left-hand column, under the face of Kali, you'll see it says Site Guide. Click on Site Guide. I've just revamped it. It's going to be completely done on the 31st. And I'm going to add an audio clip that will be kind of me speaking and taking you on a guided tour through the site, section by section. There are 13 sections of Metahistory Org. And with the new Site Guide, you will be able to see and preview a little bit of what is in each of these sections. And uh, I hope that it will be much more user-friendly than it has been before because people have been complained about getting lost in Meta history because it's the equivalent of, I don't know, 10 or 12 books. It's a very you know? big, it's very big, yeah. Yeah, but basically it consists of two parts. One is things to help people criticize and analyze belief systems, especially beliefs about the Messiah and superhuman powers and cosmic plans and things of that sort. And secondly, it contains the Gaia Sophia material, which is the orientation toward uh, our connection, each individual's intimate connection with the divinity of the earth. And that's what the site is about in its totality. Very good. So please go there and just take your time to sit down. I'm going to put the audio clip on as soon as I can. Listen to me, and I'll walk you through Metahistory Org, and then you can pick and choose whatever material in the site is relevant to you, which you want to dig into at this particular moment. Very good. And uh, do, do you have links uh, as well to your uh, book up on the website, uh, John, or do you recommend people go to Amazon uh, for that? Yeah, there's a link to Not in His Image on the website, and... Um, you, or you can just find it on Amazon. There's some interesting, uh, there's some interesting reviews on Amazon as well. Okay, very good, John. Again, the website here, then metahistory.org. We will have this linked up on redeskreations.com, so you can click through easily from there. Uh, the book is called Not in His Image, and here in the next segment here for our members, we're going to further discuss a little bit about the uh, bas- basically the, the that the time is of essence here as well. This is uh, connected with the planetary shift and, and, and that something new is on the way in. I'm going to ask uh, John to elaborate further what, what his interpretation of 2012 is and much more. So I hope that you stay with us here. And same to you, John. Thank you here for the first segment. Stay with us and we'll be back uh, with more than after this break. That's our first hour with John Lash and uh, we are in for an interesting discussion in hour two for Red Eyes members. With the uh, first hour as a foundation, we continue to talk about the insertion of the idea of the Antichrist figure into Christianity and what function this might carry on a bigger scale. Uh, John posed the question of uh, why the Gnostics or the uh, disciples then of the myth of Sophia didn't do anything to protect themselves from the persecution and extermination of knowledge. Well, maybe they did uh, in a way that is related to the idea of the Antichrist. We talk about the New World Order and their plans of control to uh, bring the planet under a one-world currency, a one-world government, and a one-world religion. We talk more about the one-world religion and the presentation of a messiah figure, potentially in 2012, and uh, who it might be, or at least what it might be coming from. We talk about 2012, why this date, if there's uh, nothing to the planetary alignment of the, or the ending of the Mayan calendar around this time. We talk about Melchizedek, the Baha'i faith, and how the plan might unfold. This is a really interesting discussion with some of John's most recent ideas and theories about the immediate future. And at the end, we also talk about the true name of Gaia. And for those who are curious, how you, uh, you, how you'll go about calling out the true name of Gaia. This is connected with the Planetary Tantra section on metahistory.org. So uh, do not miss this second hour with John Lash.
are exposing the agenda of the globalist elite, which I'm totally in favor of. The same time that they're doing that, they're saying, oh, and by the way, don't you know that the ancient mystery religions were the source of occult practices, and it was in these movements that the, uh, the forerunners of this globalist elite uh, learned uh, their sinister game. Absolutely and totally wrong. And that's a very serious error to make, because as I said at the beginning of this talk, the mysteries are part of the solution. They are not part of the problem. And so if we contaminate them by association with the solution, I think we're going to be uh, making a very serious error there. Okay, well, th there's a few points here then that we can uh, talk about right away. If, if you sure. look at the, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, about the expansion of the Roman Empire, uh, again, a lot of researchers are, are, are drawing uh, the the connection between the Roman Empire and Christianity when uh, when... when uh, you know, uh, we have the Christianization, uh, Christianization with the Constantine and so forth of the Roman That's Empire. Right. Um, and then to a lot of researchers, the Roman Empire, Empire has a history in, in, in pagan religion. Uh, what, can you, what can you say about that? Many people would then say, ah, oh, look at that. That's evidence that the roots of the whole uh, project here that began are actually pagan in their origin. Yeah, well, Christianity in the, through Constantine, and I have a comment about him coming up here in a minute, Christianity through Constantine, who effectuated the marriage of Christianity with the Roman state, has nothing to do with the, with the indigenous paganism of the Roman people, the inhabitants of the empire. The inhabitants of the Roman empire were many different nationalities, Italian, Spanish, or Iberian, Greek, even the, the Britonic peoples of the British Isles as you know, came under the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was a vast organization, but the populace of the Roman Empire were pagans. And when Constantine, Constantine, you know, was the first Christian emperor, right? Constantine was about as much of a Christian as George Bush, mm. you know? Yeah. That's the kind of Christian he was. Even his historian, his official historian, Eusebius, said of Constantine, and he wasn't sure that his conversion was an act, a political act, or whether it was genuine. Right. But in any case, it had to be portrayed as genuine because you have to write a good story about the people who are in power. I mean, even the historian who gave us that story of Constantine's conversion is admitting bald-facedly how phony it was. The purpose of that story was so that there would be a nice, pretty conversion story to convince people that uh, there was something authentic at the basis of the marriage of the Roman military empire and Christianity. Mm. The Roman military empire merged with Christianity to become the Holy Roman Empire. But the paganism, the indigenous paganism of the Roman, of the people who lived under the Roman Empire, did not merge with Christianity at all. So you have to make that distinction. And do you think it's therefore today that we have uh, a, a lot of the the, uh, the 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 pagan blend, if you if you know what I mean, with Christianity? In that sense, we can look at the the winter solstice celebration. It's very kind to call it a blend, Henrik. It's just a pure ripoff. <laughs> you know, uh, one remark that I found quite alarming occurs in the beginning of this film called Esoteric Agenda, which is an expose in some respects of the Codex, Codex Alimentarius. And uh, one of the remarks, I think this film is done by someone called Ben Sherman. Uh, Stewart, Ben Stewart. We have ben had, Stewart, had him on the program, me. actually, yes. One of the things that Ben Stewart says is that Christianity is permeated with pagan symbolism and ritual. And he infers from that that paganism survives in a manner in Christianity. He says, paganism in its evolution, that's his exact term, meaning as it developed or morphed, paganism morphed or survived in Christianity. Nothing could be less true at all. Let me give you an analogy. Suppose a group of people came into your house of your family, of you and your brothers and sisters and your mother and father, and they took everything that's in your house, all of your personal belongings, your records, your diaries, your clothes, and they moved them to another house and wore all your clothes and kept all your diaries and photographs around and actually took over your life. 
and stole your identity. But they could not actually live your life, could they? No. It would be a stolen identity. So, likewise, Christian, uh, paganism, the true life of paganism, could never be stolen. And so, the true life and spirit of paganism did not survive in Christianity, did not survive at all, except in very uh, remote country areas of Europe, very, very er areas where people still clung to their pre-Christian rituals and beliefs. What happened was that Christianity simply ripped off the rituals and the symbols of paganism and used them for their own purposes because it was easy. It was that was an easy way to get the pagan people to believe that Christianity was similar to what they already embraced. Right, you right. Know? It's a, that that's the smooth transition because otherwise, if if it would have been too too foreign, the people would never have uh, accepted it. They wouldn't let it and into they would their have, lives. And they would have rejected it, and they did reject it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, uh, the, a, a great part of the pagan world for centuries, let's say that the rise of Christianity began actually with the Zadokite cult in Palestine around 150 BC, before the his, supposed historical Jesus. And so there's a period of about 150 BC up until about 450 AD, that's like uh, more than 500 years when Christianity had to, uh, you know, gradually took over. There was an enormous resistance in the pagan world at that time. Uh, a number of the pagan intellectuals who were the teachers and highly respected figures of that time. Uh... A warm welcome. My name is Henrik Palmgren and uh, I hope that you are comfortable wherever you are in the world and ready for another radio program. We have a uh, really good program for you today that will start off our 2010 season. We have comparative mythologist, author and teacher John Lash with us on the line. He's behind the website metahistory.org where uh, a lot of the world's myths, legend and uh, Gnostic teachings are uh, collected and discussed. I'm uh, sure that you've listened to our past programs uh, that we've done with John. Uh, if not, I recommend that you go into our archive and uh, tune in. Uh, as you might know, John is the author of Not in His Image, Gnostic Vision, Sacred Ecology, and The Future of Belief. We have some r very interesting topics lined up for uh, today's program. We are going to talk about basically the, uh, the mysteries, uh, Gnosticism and mystery schools, uh, and also collect, uh, connect this with the uh, globalist elite uh, from many camps around the alternative uh, research. We often hear that the elite are steeped, as it were, in uh, the mystery religions, that they practice occult and sometimes even pagan rituals. The question, of course, is, uh, is this true? Can uh, this be specified further? And this is what we're going to begin to talk about with John here today. And then later on in our second hour, we are going to talk more about the, what the uh, Gnostics did to protect their tradition and how they actually planted something in the minds of the uh, mind control freaks uh, that control our world today. And this is something that uh, John elaborates on, actually will sabotage uh, sabotage their plans, basically. And this is actually related to the immediate future as well, if you will, then the 2012 date. So uh, we have a full set of uh, topics here to discuss uh, further on today. So with that, I'd like to say uh, welcome back to Red Ice Radio, uh, John Lash, and thank you for coming on the program again. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you, as always. Uh, I think it would be really good if we can uh, set the stage a little bit, as it were, first here, John, and address the uh, presentations that you've done on the uh, mysteries, uh, Gnosticism as well. Uh, this is something that you wrote about, of course, in your book, Not in His Image. And uh, then, when, of course, we can go further into this and connecting it with your views on the uh, global elite, basically where things are heading, and some of the, I guess, then misconceptions about their involvement with the mysteries, uh, the these illuminated societies, and their use of the occult and Gnosticism. Uh, so, if you will, John, tell us a little bit about, about the the mysteries and what you mean with the mysteries uh, in regards to your writing and, and research, John. Well, the mysteries, have been, as you know, have been one of the primary subjects of my work. Uh, certainly, my book, Not in His Image, contains more information and elaboration about the nature of the mysteries, their origin, the practices that uh, 
were done in them and so forth than any other book to my knowledge. I uh, don't want to be blowing my own horn here, but it is simply a fact as far as I know that you will not find any other book or any other source on the internet which gives you such an intimate and complete view of what the pagan mysteries were. The mysteries of the pagan world, the Mediterranean world, and the Near East and Egypt during the centuries uh, before uh, the Christian era. And I'd like to say, Henry, to start out, just before we go into the subject, uh, that I'd, I'd like to pose a question, well, why is this subject so important? Because after all, the mysteries that we're going to talk about a little bit here are very ancient. Uh, they were eliminated, uh, radically uh, destroyed. Their teachers were persecuted and murdered. Uh, a large part of the, almost all of the literature of the mysteries was destroyed, burned. And there were no mysteries practiced, no mystery religions and no mystery cults operating in Europe after uh, the death of Hypatia in 415 AD. As you know, that incident of the murder of Hypatia is the opening chapter of my book. Yes. So I would like to say, well, what are we doing here? Why are we dragging ourselves back into this ancient uh, religious movement, this ancient spiritual movement, which is long dead? Why is it important? Uh, I think that at the end of this interview, I hope that at the end of this interview, it will be clear to your listeners that the, our knowledge of what the mysteries were is important because the mysteries are part of the solution. They were part of the solution for humanity when they existed, and they are part of the solution today. Uh, whereas all that we learn on the Internet and in many, many books about the Illuminati, the reptilian bloodlines, uh, the, 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 the use of mind control and occultism, in a master program of totalitarian control. All that we hear about this is all about the problem. And we hear a lot about this. But the mysteries are about the solution. And I truly believe that if we go back and look at what the mysteries were in their true nature, and what was done in the mysteries, it will provide us with the right orientation to face the situation in the world today. Uh, and this uh, apparent uh, takeover of society by uh, a totalitarian or globalist uh, elite. So that's why the subject uh, is so important. Absolutely. I hope that's clear. Absolutely. And maybe if, if you like, in, in brief here, John, you can also tell us a little bit about the, uh, basically your background in terms, well, what, what I reckon got you started in all this. So we can talk about the philosophies of Friedrich Nietzsche a little bit and how he influenced your life and, and your work as well. Is, is he the primary uh, philosopher who got your eyes open uh, to, to these subjects to begin with, John? Well, Nietzsche, I mentioned Nietzsche in the beginning, in the preface to my book, Not in His Image. And uh, I describe in there how when I encountered Thus Big Zarathustra, and I read a little bit of Nietzsche, I was only 17 at the time, I was living in a very small fishing village in Maine called Friendship, Maine, and I had nobody to, you know, talk to, but I was deeply impacted by this philosopher. I have to say that what impressed me about Nietzsche was that he dared to say that Christianity was a, a crapulent and dangerous faith. And since I was living in a tiny little community of 900 people that was dominated by a Christian cult, uh, I was uh, happy to hear that uh, someone of his stature say that, because that's exactly has how I felt at the age of 17. And so the way that I have followed Nietzsche and attempted to, to uh, complete his work is in his critique of Christianity. Mm. Because he, only, he didn't really critique Christianity very well. He only pointed out a couple of things about it. And I vowed when I read Nietzsche that I would carry that critique to its final conclusion, which is what I do. And I want to point out that I have nothing against Christians as people. I've lived with Christians. I've known many of them all my life. I'm talking about the belief system and the ideology of Christianity. I'm talking about a belief system. I'm not talking about flesh and blood people. I do not hate Christians. 
but I do despise the belief system that has uh, established itself in the world as Christianity. Mm. And as you know, I, I have uh, analyzed that belief system at length. I call it salvationism. And uh, it's a salvationist uh, faith. And I truly believe that this salvationist faith is, is a toxic ideology. It's a pathological and psychotic outbreak of the human mind, and it's very dangerous for our species. So it was Nietzsche that initially put me on that path of, uh, gave me the boost, you could say, mm. uh, to uh, make my critique of Christianity, which you'll find in not in his image. But as far as the mysteries are concerned, uh, that's a different story. Uh, Nietzsche didn't write anything about the mysteries, and uh, it was not through Nietzsche that I got turned in that direction. But, but there's one thing in, in Nietzsche that, that kind of a little bit dovetails with this idea as well. I mean, he wrote about the concept of the Superman, for instance, and, right. and the Nazis have been, uh, you know, blamed for uh, for adopting uh, this this idea a little bit as well. And, and they were also, you know, in, from that from their point of view, then steeped in, in, in the occult and have occult roots and so forth. And that this this spawned this murderous, uh, you know, vo volatile uh, political uh, philosophy, pretty much. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I do not adopt or endorse uh, Nietzsche's concept of the Superman in the sense of any kind of fascist or authoritarian super race theory or master race theory. Absolutely do not endorse it at all. I think it's despicable, and I have no interest in that. And I did not um, pick up that element in Nietzsche. I did not take Nietzsche's uh, writings about the Superman in that direction. Um, one of the there are a number of key claims that are made about the mysteries and Gnostics in connection with the mysteries that. Uh, really need to be corrected. And one of these is the claim of deification. Deification, that is, the turning of a human being into a god. Or in the same sense, uh, achieving a superhuman state. Uh, something that you will often read uh, in writings of scholars who uh, expound about the mysteries and also in 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 talks of current people who are s saying that there was something bad in the mysteries they will both give you the same piece of information they will say that the goal of initiation in the ancient pagan mysteries was some kind of deification that is to say the turning of the human being into a divine being or the realizing realization of some divine empowerment well that is simply not the case. The, it is not the case in the sense that initiation in the mysteries would have fostered in people a sense of being superhuman or godlike and therefore superior to all other people. Uh, not at all. The experience of initiation in the mysteries allowed those who underwent it to, to discover their own hidden powers especially the hidden power of noose or the divine intelligence. The point that I make, which no other scholar seems to have made, is that the elevation of human consciousness in the mysteries, the heightened awareness, was not uh, an inflation of the ego to a godlike state. It was the discovery of one's divine intelligence. And that germ of divine intelligence exists in everyone. The mysteries were egalitarian uh, movement. It's totally wrong to assume that they could have been the incubation tanks for uh, elitist power freaks. It's totally wrong. There is no historical basis for that. That is a completely unfounded claim. As a matter of fact, history tells us that the mysteries were open to all people. They were open to everyone of every age or every class. Slaves could participate in the mysteries as well as emperors, and they did. So the mysteries were egalitarian, and they did not have at their heart any kind of agenda that can be remotely compared to an Illuminati fascist totalitarian con control scheme. That is entirely false, and I would challenge anyone who has made that claim 
uh, for instance, David Icke, to come forth with the evidence that that was the case. When you go into the evidence that exists historically about the mysteries, you will find that they were not at all of that character. So that's one of the things that's concerned me lately. Uh, and we talked about this before the interview is that, um, you find this claim coming up more and more, uh, as people are. And, uh, one of the things that I would say is that whenever you have military orders and secret orders, uh, you're not talking about the mysteries or anything derived from them. The mysteries were not like that. They had no military factor whatsoever. And that's one of the reasons why they could be could have been wiped out. Yes, yes, And exactly. why they couldn't protect themselves. Uh, we had a, a gentleman called Gary Biltcliffe a while back on the program, and he, for instance, told about the Etruscans, the pre-Roman civilization, and mm -hmm. basically how uh, their knowledge of uh, the building of the aqueducts and, and certain things... Uh, were basically ripped, uh, you know, by the uh, by the Roman Empire, and they gained a lot of their knowledge from this uh, allegedly them very very friendly uh, people, and they had a lot of uh, valuable information that the Roman Empire uh, used in order to to ex expand in the in the in the manner that they did, you know. Oh, totally. The Etruscans were an indigenous people of Italy. Uh, who gave, who generously and freely gave uh, to the foundations of Roman culture. Uh, and then they were, of course, uh, you know, eliminated when they, had been, when they had given what they had to give. And they didn't fit into the uh, particular power structure that the, uh, that the Romans were creating in that, in that time and setting. You know, it's just tremendously important that we need to understand that um, the great orchestration of uh, evil, if you want to call it social evil. I don't believe in cosmic evil, as you know, Henrik, in, in absolute or cosmic evil mm. or some satanic or demonic force in the universe, but I do believe in social evil. And so what is social evil? It's just an expression of a human psychosis. It's an expression of a breakdown of, of the human mind and of a pathology that can... Uh, run rampant and is doing so now but when we were trying to trace we're, we're, we're humans and we're fascinated by what what happened to us and how we could be in this terribly frightening world that we live in today and so we're going back and trying to understand this orchestration and we're digging up all this information about these secret societies and these knights templars in the process of doing all that fine let's not forget that there was a an inviolable teaching and an inviolable core of human wisdom that has nothing to do with that. And that was preserved in the mysteries. And that's why the mysteries, even though they were destroyed, live inside us today. I don't believe we can recreate the mysteries as such in the form that they were, say, 400 or 500 BC, or even during the time of, of, uh, you know, several couple of centuries after the Christian era. It's not about recreating them, it's about dis rediscovering what the mysteries were in our own human potential. And that's where the solution lies. Mm. I really believe that that is where the solution lies, and I believe it's time to start talking as much about the solution as about the problem. And uh, that's something that we want to do here. I want to ask you a few things uh, more before that. For instance, the the schism then, or the, the, the psychotic, if you will, or, or a schizophrenic, rather, a relationship to uh, the message of Christ. Again, it's very difficult because you can pick certain things and interpret that in a certain way and so forth, but the, the overall and basic idea of, 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 of Christ and, you know, love your neighbor, be kind, show love, uh, uh, things like that. How can that message, so, so to speak, be taken over then by this, by this other cult, the Roman Empire and later on Christianity, which uh, expanded itself with violence and, and everything that goes against this message. How do you kind of explain that, if you will, John? You know, we've reached a point, Eric, I think, where we've, we have so much delved into this problem that we're at risk of, of getting buried in what we've learned, uh, even if it's valid. So I'd like to propose a new way, a new kind of idiom or a new paradigm for looking at the problem of the uh, globalist uh, 
control game. I'd like to say it's not about us or them. It's about a psychotic break in the human species. And the people who are instruments of that psychotic break are the ones who are doing the harm to the rest of the species. Mm. Okay? So it's about a psychosis. And any of us can be subject to this psychosis. And, and if we want to say... First, recognize the psychosis. I think we're doing, made some immense steps toward recognizing how the psychosis operates. In fact, I realize one thing, that these people, this small globalist elite who practice all these elaborate mind control uh, games on us, are mind controlled by their own games. Hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're not Illuminati sitting back in some state of enlightenment and pulling the strings. They are pulled by their own strings. Right, right. Yep. They're as sick as the game that they perpetrate. And any of us can contract that sickness. Now, what we have to understand is we have to respect the sickness and how clever it is. The sickness is very clever. And it can use love or peace or anything you like to achieve its aims. You know, uh, back uh, in, the, in the last years or so before I left the States, I was reading about serial killers a lot and researching serial killers. And I read a couple of books about Ted Bundy. Mm -hmm. He's probably the most famous serial killer in the States. He killed like 16 or 20 people. And Ted Bundy is what you call, you know, a sociopath. It's an important term. These people in the globalist elite are not privileged or enlightened people who are operating from some occult power of, of omnipotence. They're just very clever sociopaths. And Ted Bundy was one of the most likable guys in the world. Mm. Did you know that? Mm. He was charming. And when a certain place, I think it was in Florida, became very alarmed because a couple of college girls had been murdered by Ted Bundy. No, I think it was in Washington State. The, uh, the town where it happened set up a, uh, a team, uh, a volunteer team. And Ted Bundy volunteered on that team to find himself totally rejected Christianity as a, as a pestilence. They called it a virus and a plague. They said it was a despicable faith. Uh, why? Mainly for one reason, which I've pointed out in my book, Christianity glorifies the redemptive value of suffering. Mm. And that is totally contrary to pagan beliefs. Pagan, a pagan We'll define later on maybe at more, at more length what I'm calling a pagan. But a pagan is a person who does not believe that human suffering has a divine purpose. That is a very pervert, perverted idea from a pagan point of view. Mm. So there was great resistance to this uh, belief system of Christianity and to the supernaturalism of the Messiah. There's no Messiah in any pagan religions. There's no equivalent to the Messiah. I have to say that, uh, unfortunately, some comparative mythologists, apart from myself, who are highly respected in this world, have led people to believe that, oh yeah, uh, the Christian Messiah, Jesus Christ the Messiah, is, is similar to other figures in pagan religion or pagan culture, such as Balder in Norse myth or Angus in Celtic myth. This is, this is a false parallel. Uh, the supernatural Messiah whose suffering has supreme magical value of saving the world is a unique to the belief system of Christianity. And pagan people would not have that belief. They would not have accepted that belief if it wasn't put over on them in a very clever way. Mm. And one of the clever ways was to say, well, we're going to adopt, don't, don't resist us, because we're going to adopt your symbols and rituals. And you'll see, we'll just use them in our way, but it'll really be the same game. And it wasn't the same game at all. And at the very same time that the uh, early Christians in Europe uh, adopted and co-opted pagan symbols and rituals, they were ferociously busy eliminating uh, the pagan tradition of books and learning and destroying the mystery centers and persecuting the leaders of those centers. So they played that double game. Well, that's a good point. I w wanted to ask you about that, then, if you, if you believe it's true that the, the Roman Empire, uh, and through them and through the military empire that you mentioned, basically they started the execution of the 
of the Gnostic people. They they uh, they killed people who had the knowledge from the ancient world, and in one sense, sense they might have extracted it for themselves, or or it might have been lost, as it claimed in many many uh, texts and so forth that the 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 literature and so forth was burned and all was 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 lost. I still think that some of, amount of that knowledge was. Uh, taken into the the top echelons within the Roman Empire, but that's difficult to say. But basically, would you say that they started the execution of the, the of the learned elders, as it were? Well, they certainly did, and there's very there there is historical evidence of that. And uh, the might of the Roman Empire, once the empire was turned, but was united with uh, the new uh, religion. Uh, some of it was directed toward the persecution of uh, paganism. You know, paganism and pagan rituals and uh, and beliefs were uh, ruled uh, uh, forbidden on penalty of death already around 385 A.D. And um, why would you need to do that, you know? Yeah. But ask this question, anybody out there who believes that Christianity was originally, or in any sense still is, a religion of love, then wouldn't you say that coexistence is essential to love? Yeah. That coexistence would be one of the first proofs of love. That if you carry love in your heart and you carry love in your relation to other human beings, that you would show them an attitude of coexistence. Isn't that reasonable? Well, when you look at the historical record, there is absolutely no record of early Christian ideologues or converts wanting to coexist with pagans or with the leaders and representatives of the mystery schools. They did everything they could to eliminate them. And you know, in many cases, Henrik, they didn't need the force of uh, the military force of the Roman emperor to do that. The, uh, the, the monks who were early monks who were created to, uh, who were converted to Christianity were like stormtroopers. Hmm. And one, uh, one historian describing the takeover of uh, Egypt by Christianity actually uses that term. It says that the Christian monks were so fanatical they were like stormtroopers. They went into the ancient sanctuaries of mystery knowledge in Egypt, the temples of Luxor, the temples of uh, of Pindera, uh, and, which is close to Nag Hammadi, and the temples of Memphis and around Cairo, and they fanatically destroyed and burned all these books. It didn't need the military to do it. The religious converts did it themselves. And the history of the rise of Christianity is is the rise, is a history of a cultural genocide of an enormous magnitude. One of the reasons why we have lost our way in this world, and why we have become a species that can be manipulated and controlled by a small psychotic group of our own members, is because the mysteries and the wisdom in the mysteries was destroyed, and we lost the foundation of our species vision. I just, this, as you know, you've read my book, this is what I, this is a story that I tell in my book. Uh, and in one way, the, the, the warring monks that you, that you mentioned, we can tie these in together with the Knights Templar then, and the Knights of Malta and these various group who were performing the, uh, d- during the Crusades as well, but there are earlier versions of, of this as well. Absolutely, you know, uh, I this business of the of the long term history of the of these secret orders and the Masons and the Illuminati and everything is is very very complicated, and I'm afraid sometimes that we might get a little lost and, and too absorbed in that. Again, that's all part of the problem, you know. I think we know enough about the problem now, since uh, we can never know enough about the problem. Excuse me, but I think we know as much about the problem as we need to know to start putting the solution together really fast.